First, I, I want to say we had a three-year-old son and we're delighted to have conceived again. I uh, went to my regular OB, went through the uh, normal things you do at that point, and then he sent me on to Georgetown University Hospital for a routine sonogram. Now I think he knew something was wrong and he didn't want to say. So I went to Georgetown by myself and was on the exam table. The sonographer started the picture and I could see the baby and suddenly the sonographer left, came back with a doctor. And the doctor started the sonography again, the pictures, and I heard him say, the fetus has hydrocephaly. I'm a special ed teacher, so I knew that was water on the brain. The fetus has spina bifida. The fetus has very little lung capacity. The fetus has, does not appear to have any kidneys. The fetus has probably no stomach and no genitals. And I'm thinking this whole time while he's saying this, well, hydrocephaly can be fixed, spina bifida can be fixed. And then I started realizing that these things couldn't be fixed. And they put down the <clears throat> wand and left the room. Well, when she got home, um, she told me the story as best she could. Uh, she had had broadsided a car on the drive home, so she came back with a big scrape on her car, and I, I, I knew something was wrong. She was very upset. So once she told me about it, that, that presented us with a, a, a situation we had no way to anticipate, and we weren't equipped to deal with it at the time. We had uh, been married for we're not, five, five years. Mm -hmm. And the idea of a, a poor prenatal diagnosis, the idea of a child dying was uh, just something that never entered our minds. So we were, th we were thrust into this sort of situation that there seemed to be no way out of. I was, not, I was not a practicing Catholic at the time. I had uh, stopped going to church after I uh, uh, went to the University of Maryland. And, but I knew, I knew, grace of my baptism, or just uh, know, sort of innately knowing there was only one place I could get any sort of answers in a situation like this. I drove uh, Hilter Skelter over to Holy Redeemer in Kensington where I had uh, gone to church every Sunday for, for most of my life before I had left the church. So that's, that's what drew me back and I, I uh, bang on the door and there's Father uh, David Bro stirring some soup. I, I, can, I can see it now, it's, it's as fresh as, as, it, as it just happened. And he came out and he spoke to, to this seemingly deranged man because I, I felt nothing but deranged at the time. I, I needed something. I didn't know what, but he did. He took some, he took, he had me sit down and he told me about his growing up on a farm in Quebec, uh, the number of brothers and sisters he had and the number of them that had died at birth living on a remote, remote farm. I don't believe they had uh, medical, medical help nearby. And he said, my brothers died, my sisters died. As a family, we grieved, as a, uh, we mourned and we moved on with our lives. I remember carrying what my little brother out to the cemetery in the back of the house. And this was so human and so sincere that I was, uh, I was immediately drawn in. And then to bring it back to us, he said, you've been asked to do the difficult thing. So not have, being a, a person of faith at that time, I knew what he meant by who, who was doing the asking. I know he was referring to our relationship with God. So I had, to, I had to internalize that and I had to take that back to my wife and try to have her see it. She had, come, she had been raised in a family of Presbyterians that were pretty stridently anti-Catholic. So I had that not only did I have to somehow convince her that this was the truth coming from one man to another man to a woman who had to carry the, the burden of, having, of, of carrying the child to term uh, that's what I did, and that's when our particular wrangle over this started. Well, first, the mixed messages were very hard because I went back to my OB who said to me, you need to go down the street. Here's a telephone number where you can get rid of this child. It's what you call a throwaway baby. And why do you want to be a walking coffin? And I kind of didn't really understand what that meant. Um, ret we returned to our Georgetown where the doctor said, a wonderful doctor, but he said, maybe just walk around the block a few times and you'll have a miscarriage. So we had a lot of 
um, misunderstandings in there and didn't really know what to, you know, what to think. Um, and then when Dan went to see the priest and I went to see the minister who said, why do you want to suffer? You, you need to terminate this pregnancy. So, and that's what I had been, I used to walk for in the pro-choice march. I mean, I was not a Catholic and I was a very liberal go get em woman. And I used to march with those women. So here I was caught in the middle with Dan coming home and saying, well, Father Bro really thinks we should do the difficult thing. And I'm thinking, he doesn't have to carry this baby, I do. But you know, we, Dan made me go talk to him. And he was such a wonderful man and very kind and very understanding and very sweet. And we started going to daily mass together. There wasn't really anything else to do. Well, it got a it got a jump start with that situation, because I understand now that faith isn't isn't really faith until it's been tested, and so and that was a great testing, and it really awoke, in in my life and in Cubby's, uh, a gift of faith, and the, the faith became, um, how to put it, and that we became eventually a, a few years later lay missionaries of charity. We just had this. Um, I don't know how to put it, this like eruption of faith in our lives where the God invaded and we got, we, we got through the, the months of um, our son, um, the, the pregnancy, and he was born and he, he died, but all along the way from Father Bro to Father Sal Jordan at Georgetown University Hospital to um, um, Monsignor uh, Raymond East, who was our... Um, Chaplain for the Lay Missionaries of Charity, which we were called to called to join a few years later, it was it was sort of a, um, a roller coaster of um, of our relationship with God. It just it just completely turned upside down, and we the peace we found in that time and in His birth and subsequently was it, it carved out a big enough space in us that we we changed our lives completely from becoming from running something called the Special Needs Children's Center which was a home for handicapped children, it became St. Joseph's House. And it made perfect sense to us that, uh, that it would become so because there wasn't, the uh, f faith became um, everything to us. In the beginning of the pregnancy, I just, I did want the suffering to be over quickly. But as the pregnancy continued, and he obviously grew, and I could feel him move, our, my greatest wish was to meet him alive. And our greatest wish together became to have him baptized. So um, the morning of his delivery, oh, we were so scared. I have to tell you how scared we were. Remember, we had this horrible diagnosis, and my family had completely left the picture. We had no support. We had no friends. We had, we had all these children who were disabled we were caring for, and those parents were pretty wrapped up in their own children, and we were wrapped up in a lot of things, too. But the morning of Francis's birth, um, Father Jordan was also a nurse. So he was allowed into the delivery room, and we all just hoped that Francis would come out alive. And gosh darn, if I didn't see him blessing that little boy and baptizing him, um, through our tears and through the operating room and all that crazy stuff, um, baptized him and gave him to us. And he was incredibly beautiful, looked just like his dad, small, only about three and a half pounds, um, but looked great, looked perfect. And we held him and sang to him and talked to him while he lived and died. And um, it seemed very surreal at the time couldn't believe still that it was happening. Um, again, it was just the two of us and Father Jordan. I mean, there wasn't any family or friends. So we bathed him and dressed him and loved him and did it. all the things that we would have done through his whole life in a very short period of time. And it was one of the highlights of our life. The after part was a little more difficult. But um, Father David said the uh, ceremony Actually, we were told at the time we, we, we didn't need a full Mass. 
Now, see, now I would have demanded a full Mass. I didn't really know. I remember, I'm still not a Catholic at that time. So we had a graveside service. Uh, some of Dan's family came. All the children of uh, St. Joseph's House, their parents came. That was our community. That was really lovely. Um, and then we celebrated his life and his birthday, and, you know, all through the years we've always celebrated. In running St. Joseph's House, we went from being social workers to being lay missionaries of charity. It, uh, what, what we experienced with one family who befriended us during Francis's, when, we were, when Cubby was uh, pregnant with Francis, were Dr. Margaret, Dr. Phil and Margaret Sheridan, who came to us and talked about their experience. In, in that way, Cubby came up with the idea, or I think guest dated over time, the idea of a peer ministry to, to support families who are going through the same thing. They were a lifesaver for us because they gave us somebody to talk to who understood us. So that was the genesis of Isaiah's Promise, which has um, become a national movement. Isaiah's Promise is very large now. I, I think for me, Francis gave the gift of my faith because two years after he died, I became a Catholic. Um, partly because I really wanted to be closer to him, him and him, both him and him, <laughs> um, also to our son Joe and, and to my husband. We, we needed to be all together, not running in different directions. The, uh, I can't imagine our life without um, recognizing the fact that Francis was a, was a human being as a as uh, disabled as he was, he was a child of God. And we all, as Cubby said, we always treated him as a, as a member of the family. And I think it, what, it, what it told our children is that we'll love you regardless of what you do, of what happens. Under every, cir every and any circumstance, we'll always love you because we were able to love our son and it was a torturous seven months in the aftermath. But they knew seeing us do that, that it, they they could love like that, that broken little boy who, that waiting to be born. That they would they would they were really our parents. And our daughter in particular was a very sort of effusive young lady. Always says thank thank you for teaching me what ro love really is. Obviously the men can't say that, but they know that. So I think that's what we were able to communicate. And we, and we what we learned from him, we also can devote to St. Joseph's House, the handicapped kids we we care for, and. Also, that penetrates into the work of Isaiah's promise because when they talk to Cubby, they know that she loved her child who died. And in, the, in that way, she strengthens them and they really come to realize the same thing in their lives and in their families. Well, certainly it, it taught me something about unconditional love. I thought I loved these children that we cared for, and I thought I loved my little, my three-year-old Joe, but this was a whole new way of love. And honestly, one of the reasons that I decided not to terminate, even though I was leaning so much for that, was that what would I ever say to Joe, our three-year-old? And that's what Dan was addressing earlier. You know, he was this little broken boy wasn't good enough. So we got rid of him. What if something happened to Joe? And what would he think if something happened to him? So see, it went down the line from Joe to our, our subsequent child after Francis, which is Mary Francis, and then our next child, our miracle baby, Johnny. So they all know um, of our real deep, unconditional love for each one of them, and I believe for each other too, um, especially now with our, all our faults. And we were always inspired by the life and work of Mother Teresa, hence we became lay missionaries of charity. But the thing that impressed me most about her work when I had learned about her life, early, relatively early in life when I was a teenager, was that she became like the people she served. She put, took off her Loretta habit and put on a sari. So she was, she was indistinguishable from the people she cared for as a, as a woman living in the slums of Calcutta. And I think this, this, our experience with Francis was a way for us to put on 
the sorry of the people we served uh, in uh, uh, St. Joseph's house. We knew the, what, what kind of fear was attached to having to, living and raising a handicapped child. We knew the fear of, of a, a, preg um, a diagnosis of, of a handicapped child. So we internalized all of that. So Francis was in a way, was our sorry. And I think it, in that sense, it made it an incredible difference in our life that we we're able not only to anticipate what they're going through, we could uh, laugh with them, we could cry with them. We became literally one with them and, and, and remain so. Over, the, over 70 families we've served at St. Joseph's House and 85 in, Isaiah's in Isaiah's Promise. promise. It, it's really been beautiful. The, the people we've met, the, the families through Isaiah's Promise who have a poor prenatal diagnosis, the, the parents of St. Joseph's House, they are the people that, to me, are heroes. Um, that they continue to fight this culture of death and culture of prejudice. And remember, the kids we have at St. Joseph's House are quite severely disabled. So, and also, I think for parents um, experiencing a poor prenatal diagnosis and their child doesn't die, and and they have this worry of who will help me care, you mm -hmm. know, for mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. I, I, we can't care for their child particularly, but. This is an example of what can happen and who can ca care for them and love them and be a part of the community and a part of the Catholic Church. The first thing I, I, I do is ask them about their baby, their unborn baby, to try and make a little connection between them and their child because to a parent it can feel like a disease. It's so frightening, you don't know it. So first try to make a connection. You know, have you named your baby? Is it a boy or a girl? Things like that. And really just start with making friends and trust, having some trust, because the trust is so important. And also a little bit of humor and friendship and laughter because it's such a gloomy, sad time. You, you have to present the fact that you won't always feel this way and that Cubby really doesn't have horns growing out of her head, you know? I really am a relatively normal person, have a relatively normal life. I'm still married, 31 years now. My children are all good. I did go on to make a family. There's all kinds of ways to make a family. Um, you don't want to talk about replacing the child that may die, but you always want to leave that door open for continuing your family in some way. I would say that um, that at least in the cases of the Isaiah's promises families, as I said, eighty-five of them, not one, have, not one has regretted yeah. their decision. In each and every case, they were happy with the decision they made, and it gave them uh, the the kind of peace that we were talking about that we found in our lives. And uh, in terms of um, the difficult, the most difficult, vexing issue, as you say. In the case of a child with spina bifida or Down syndrome, you, it's pretty evident that the child's going to live. Where is the hope there? And what you can say, what you can say is that uh, love will find a way. It's not always the case. We've had some parents that went through some terrible trials, ra trials raising their children. But a choice made in love, a choice made in love, in the end, is the right choice. That, that, that's that's what I would say, and it's I can't tell them that that's going to be the the result that she's going they're going to experience, but I I can tell them this is what happened to me, and if you're faithful, this is what will happen to you. I would say the most important thing to remember is that he has the the truth of God's love to demonstrate to these people, to the, whoever the person is, and if they say, if he says, with with uh, with confidence and with love, that you're making the right choice when you choose life, that this is the choice that will lead you to happiness, as as difficult as that may be to say, that that is going to be the end result. That is what they will experience. And that's why they, they go to see him in the first place. They want to hear that. They don't want to hear, there's no hope here. Do whatever you want. That's what we experienced at, uh, 
Cubby experienced uh, at first when she went to see her minister. And there, there was no resolution there. There was no sense of peace. It just created more confusion. We, we wanted to know that our, uh, that our choice for love was the right choice, and it turned out to be.